and uh, yesterday we saw a collection of evidence about dark matter at different length scales. I review how we got uh, convinced over the last decades that dark matter must exist. And uh, near the end, I made a list of properties that every particle dark matter model must satisfy. Okay, so let's take it from there. And let me remind you a few important facts. And uh, okay, so uh, I was a bit fast at the end yesterday, so I want to review. Uh, what these constraints are, and uh, also mention a couple that I didn't mention uh, yesterday, okay? So the first one is the density. And this will be very important for the lecture of today because we will go back in time in the early universe. And we will consider some dark matter models, depending on, on the time and on the questions. Of course, questions are encouraged, so let's try to have an interactive lecture, and, uh, but in the end we will compute relic densities today. So the topic of today's lecture is calculation of relic density. So we always have to face this number and try to reproduce that. So I say that the density of dark matter, which we like to explain as a ratio, as a dimensionless ratio between the density itself and the critical density that was defined yesterday not only by me, but also by other lecturers. This ratio is 27%, okay? And uh, there is a slightly different way to define this quantity that I will be using. It's uh, maybe more common in particle physics, but it's, it's a very convenient way. And uh, let me just introduce the way. So instead of using omega, I'm going to use the parameter xi, okay? Xi, these are definitions, is defined as the ratio between the dark matter density and the entropy density, okay? So the entropy density is the entropy density of the universe, which scales like the cube of the temperature. I will give you an expression for this later, but uh, why this variable is nice? This variable is nice because after you make the dark matter, after you produce the dark matter the way we will see today, this quantity is constant over time, okay? So if it's constant, what the value we compute in the early universe is the same value we have to face today. So you will just make an easier comparison between what we compute in the early universe and what we see today. So this is not a dimensionless number, it's a dimensionful parameter because in units where h bar and the speed of light are equal to one, an energy density has mass dimension four, and the entropy density has mass dimension three. So this ratio has the dimension of an energy in natural units, and uh, it is 0 0.44 electron volt. Okay, so that's the number we will try to reproduce today with our relic uh, density calculations. Okay, so again, we mentioned yesterday that it has to be very stable. What this very means depends if it's unstable in the decay channel. Something I didn't mention yesterday, but somebody pointed out after the lecture, that of course dark matter must be neutral. Neutral under ENM, okay? So the coupling to photons must be very weak. There are several reasons for that. First, because we don't see it. If it was able to emit photons, we would be able to see that. Also because as we saw this morning, uh, the coupling between dark matter and the photons in the early universe cannot be too strong, otherwise perturbation will not be able to grow until recombination. So there are bounds that we can discuss in more details later if you're interested. Uh, then what else? Uh, stable, neutral, oh, very important for today, cold. 
this is something we will see later, but as I say, uh, these constraints translates into the requirement that when the temperature of the universe was one kV, dark matter must behave as a pressureless fluid, okay? Uh, cold, stable, ah, okay, last thing we didn't discuss yesterday is what about the mass? Okay, so we went through a review of all the astronomical and cosmological uh, evidence for, for dark matter, but all of these observations do not tell us anything about the mass. The mass, we really have a wide window of, uh, available for particle physics candidates, and uh, there are bounds that it's worth mentioning. If the dark matter particle is a boson, so it has a, an integer spin, for example, the axion, okay, if you know what it is, then the mass has to be bigger than this number. Okay, so why do we get this limit? We get this limit because uh, the Compton wavelength of a particle with this mass will be larger than the smallest object we observe. So we will not be able to pack dark matter particle inside uh, the smallest object we observe today in the sky. There is an analogous limit for fermions. For fermion, the limit is way more severe so the mass has to be much, much bigger. And the reason is that because there is poly blocking, okay? So it's more difficult to pack fermions because of poly, uh, the exclusion principle of, of poly. So we already have some limits. These are not very strong. You see that for, uh, for comparison, WIMPs that are very popular dark matter candidates, which we'll review today, they have a mass, very broadly speaking, in this range, okay, between 10 giga electron volt and 10 tera electron volt. Is there a question? This one? Okay, so uh, this limit comes from the observation of objects in the sky, which are mostly made of dark matter, and these objects have a size, because we observe that. Then, a particle with this mass has an associated component wavelength, which unless you satisfy this bound, it will be bigger than the object we see. And so it's in contradiction with observation. It's not possible to confine the particles within this object. For the fermion, it's uh, bigger because the limit is, is, is higher because you go through an analogous consideration, but then you have to fill the Fermi sphere. So you, you cannot put all the fermions in the fundamental state because they are fermion. So there is a poly exclusion principle. So you have to populate all the lower energy state, and then you have the Fermi volume, and again, you compare the volume with the size of the object you see. Yes? Uh, so I think this uh, for uh, dwarf galaxies. So these are small, smaller than, uh, than the Milky Way, uh, but they're mostly made of dark matter. So it definitely has to fit within a dwarf galaxy. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. So that method can be charged under QCD? It can be charged under QCD, then the limit strongly depends on the mass. So if it's very heavy, it could be charged under QCD. Uh, yes. Then the production is a bit tricky to compute because, but yeah, yeah. There are mass windows where you can have a color relic. But this, well, also this strongly depends on the mass because all the bounds you put are sensitive to the number density, but we measure today the mass density. So if the dark matter particle is heavier, you have less of them around because rho is fixed, but rho is m times n. So m bigger, n smaller. But so, what do you mean? Because you can have polar states. What do you mean, sorry? Oh, no, no, they confine, they confine, yeah, but they can, I mean, in today, you, they will be confined today, yeah, but in the early universe, when they, before the QCD phase transition, 
then they will be like, uh, like quark and gluons were uh, deconfined in the early universe. But then, then of course, they, as the universe cools down, they form bound states. Yes? Yes, we will, we will not see that in great details. That's a calculation of a hot relic that I don't plan to go, to go through with too many details because, as you say, it's ruled out. I, le I leave it as a homework. Ruled out by this constraint that the mass has to be 100 electron volts. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's ruled out irrespective of whether it's cold or not. Yes, yes. But also the number density. If you go through the relic density calculation, you see that they are too light to account for the dark matter today. No, no, but we know that the standard model neutrinos have to be lighter. No, no, not standard model. Oh, you mean neutrinos so in general. If I have additional neutrinos. Yeah, yeah, this is true for any fermion, any fermion. Gravitino, it's three half spin, it's not one half, same story. Okay. It is very strong. It is very strong. That's few kV in mass. The sterile neutrinos, it's few kV, the interesting mass region. Well, sterile neutrino as dark matter candidates or sterile neutrinos as sterile neutrinos? It's, it's different. Of course, so this is a limit that comes from observation of objects made of dark matter. So there is nothing wrong with having a strong neutrino at 1 EV if it's not cosmological abundant today. Okay. What about uh, dark matter very heavy? I mean, yes. For example, now with ice cube, there are so we'll get to the, up, you're asking if there is an upper limit. We'll get to that, there are upper limits, but they have big caveats. These are very solid. So I will show an upper limit at the end of today's lecture. But, Wimps, oh, I will, sorry, I will, it's a broad class of candidates. I will define that in a second. I, said, I, I will, I apologize, I will give a definition. Good, okay. So now, the topic of today's lecture is, uh, So, I, ah. so as we saw this morning and yesterday, and as I will see a lot of times this week, at very early times, at very hot temperatures, the universe was uh, homogeneous, isotropic, uh, at least all the standard model matter, photons, electrons, uh, quarks, they were in thermal equilibrium, and uh, dark matter must come from somewhere, okay? to end up today with a universe that is, as a dark matter abundance five times larger than the one in baryons, we need to understand how we produce this amount of dark matter in the universe that then generated the perturbation that then evolved into the structure where we live today. Okay, so the landscape of theoretical models is huge, okay? There are many models. So I will try to give a very broad classifications that it will just work for the following reason. So according to this definition, there are two main ways to produce dark matter in the early universe. The first one is thermal production, and it's defined in the following way. The dark matter particle was the dark matter particle was in thermal equilibrium. So I just say that that uh, early temperature, early times, hot temperatures, electrons, photons, everything was sharing a temperature. They were interacting efficiently enough that they were in thermal equilibrium. In this first category, the dark matter particle was in thermal equilibrium with them, okay? And, there's a big and, the other important feature,
the, by studying the details of how we went from a thermalized situation where the dark matter was in thermal equilibrium to the universe today where nothing is in thermal equilibrium anymore, the process of departure from thermal equilibrium is the one that sets the relic density. Okay? So that's the definition of the thermal production. And that's the first one. So I say I divide into two different ways. The second way is if the first one was thermal, the other one will be non-thermal, okay? And non-thermal is anything else, okay? So, at least, it's not an ambiguous classification. You either are in the first or in the second. So the goal of today uh, is to go through this one very, very well. Not too carefully, because the actual way you do a calculation is by solving Boltzmann equation uh, numerically on a, on a computer. What we will do today are analytical estimates to see how the relic density depends on the, on the mass of the dark matter, on the cross-section, on the particle physics parameters. But we'll, we will mostly focus on this, okay? So that's the goal, to, to understand this. About non-thermal production, I have a couple of examples that I can give you at the end of the lecture if there is time. But the fourth lecture, so the one on Friday, will be entirely on axions. And so, on uh, Friday, we will see for sure one example of non-thermal production, okay? The one for the axion. Um, so let's, is it clear, the distinction? Okay, so let's, let's, let's study thermal production. So the first question we need to, The first question we need to answer is, how do we thermalize? So I say that in this, yes? I didn't, I didn't hear well, sorry. Yes? Oh, so this is the, the first one. Because the only requirement here is that at some point back in the day, back in the time when the universe was very young, the dark matter was in thermal equilibrium. But then we know it's not anymore today. So there is a departure from thermal equilibrium, as you were saying. But the crucial thing, as we will see, is that this departure from thermal equilibrium is the process responsible for setting the relic density in a way that I will explain. Thermalish or? Well, I, it may be then more, if I understand what you're saying, it may belong more to this one. Yeah, Frisine is here. Frisine is, so, Frisine is a situation where the dark matter is actually never in thermal equilibrium, but it's produced via scattering of particles that are in thermal equilibrium. So freezing is what I plan to do in the last 50 minutes if there is time. Otherwise, we, you can come to me and, and, and ask after the lecture. Okay, so how do we thermalize? So let me introduce some notation. For the rest of this lecture, the dark matter particle will be chi, just a Greek letter that is good for a dark matter candidate. It doesn't mean it's a fermion, I know it's used uh, it's conventional to call fermion sky sometimes, but this is just a generic particle. And the only way we can get, and we can thermalize in the early universe is if we have these processes where Q dark matter particles find each other and they annihilate into Q standard model particles and the back reaction, okay? Here by SM, I mean any, standard model particle, okay? 
and so on. So it can be an electron, it can be a quark, it can be a photon, it can be anything. So if these reactions are efficient, then the dark matter particles are in equilibrium with SM, that we know are in thermal equilibrium. So what does it mean being efficient? So let's try to do the following estimate. Uh, let's compute how many of these reactions how many of these reactions happen in some time interval, okay? Between T1 and T2, where T is just the time, the age of the universe. So this number, just by definition of the quantity I'm about to write, it's just the interval over time of the rate. Gamma is the rate for this process here, okay? And it's defined as the number of interactions per unit time, okay? So if you have interaction over time, you integrate over the time, then you find the total number of interactions, okay? This is just the definition of gamma, if you want. And this is something we can, com we can compute with, if we know the, the interaction of these particles, we know the Lagrangian, as it's called in QFT. So for each model, we can compute that and find the precise value. Okay, so let me change variables here. Uh, so it is more convenient to use temperature as a variable. And let me also write this. Okay, so T dot is the time derivative, um, no, sorry. the other way around, here, okay, so I, ah. okay, it's gamma T over T dot, dt over t, okay? Okay, now, if uh, you remember, maybe it was mentioned yesterday, but otherwise I will tell you, I will tell you now, the entropy of the universe, the entropy of the universe is conserved through the expansion, okay? So S is the entropy density, so entropy per unit volume. So this product, S times the scale factor cube, is constant, unless you have some entropy injection, which we're not considering here, okay? So we also know that S is proportional to T cube. This is a result that uh, you can derive in the statistical mechanics. Yes, it's not only belonging to, to cosmology. You take a Fermi Dirac or both science and distribution, you compute pressure, you compute energy density, you compute the entropy density, it scales like T cube. So you put these two things together and you find that T times A is constant through the expansion. This is not precisely right. There is a G star factor, if you know what it is, which is the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, but it's good enough for our purposes, okay? There are tiny corrections to this relation. But this is useful, it's useful because I leave it as a homework. You can check that T dot over T is minus the Hubble, Hubble, which it was defined already yesterday, but it's the derivative time derivative of the scale factor over the scale factor itself, okay? Okay, so now I go back to this equation and uh, I take care of this minus sign, so now I switch from T2 to T1, and it's gamma over H dt over T, okay? Okay, now let's remember that 
I define T1 being less than T2 because I was considering T1 as the initial time, T2 as the final time. The universe cools down, so T1 must be bigger than T2, okay? If I consider universe at the earlier time, it was hotter, okay? So this integral is positive, which is a good check. And I put the minus sign, I switched from T1 to T2 to T2 to T1. So this is bigger than zero, as it should be. It's a number of interactions. And uh, now let's do a naive estimate. And let's take T1 equal to 2 T2, OK? So I take the case where the ratio between temperatures is a factor of 2 which is also the ratio between the scale factors. So this is a time interval where the universe doubles its size. Well, the, view, the volume is actually eight times bigger because it's, it goes like the scale factor cube. But, so I'm taking a time interval where the universe, the scale factor gets twice bigger. And uh, if, I assume, if I assume that gamma over H within this interval doesn't change much, Okay. I can do the integral just by making an approximation. Gamma over H is constant. Log of T is just the log of, I'm just doing the derivative of dt over t, so I get the log, okay? So log of T is more or less one. So what we derive is that within the time the universe doubles its size, the number of interaction is given by gamma over H up to order one factors, okay? So this is a very useful result because it tells us that in order to establish whether we achieve thermal equilibrium or not, we have to compare two quantities, gamma and H, okay? If gamma is bigger than H, we are in thermal equilibrium. If gamma is, lower, is um, smaller than H, we are not because we do not, do not even collide once, okay? Of course, this is a qualitative uh, criterion. If you want to study thermalization well, you have to solve Boltzmann equation, but this is good enough for our purposes, okay? So it also makes sense because if you think about that, there are two competing effects. So there is this reaction here, scattering of dark matter particles to standard model particles, they want to thermalize. Okay, they want to achieve thermal equilibrium. But the expansion doesn't, because the expansion is diluting the universe and is making very hard for the dark matter particle to find each other, okay? So there are two competing effects, and uh, each one of them has a time scale associated with that, because the rate, the inverse rate is the time scale it takes to get to an interaction, and the up rate is also a time scale. And so you compare these two time scales, and the, if the time scale for interaction is shorter than the one for the expansion, then you're in thermal equilibrium. If not, you are not, okay? So the first thing to check when you have a dark matter model is that, well, do I ever get to the point where gamma is bigger than H? If yes, then we may belong to this class. I say we may because we also need to satisfy the second one. But at least we satisfy thermalization, okay? Okay. So let's now see how the production works. Okay, so maybe I should delete here. Okay, so let's assume that we are, is there any question first? Okay, so let's assume that we are in a situation where gamma is actually bigger than H, so we start from a thermal distribution. So we know that, at a high enough temperature, the number density of chi 
is the number density of a species that is in thermal equilibrium, okay? So what is this expression? The expression depends, so I'll give you two expressions, actually. It's So if it's in thermal equilibrium, I can define a, a temperature because it's in thermal equilibrium. So uh, don't worry about the numerical factor. This is a Riemann function evaluated in three pi square. G effective, it's uh, three over four. It's a, if it's a fermion, it's one. If it's a boson, times the spin degeneracy. All you need to care about is that this goes like T cube, okay? This corresponds to the case where the temperature is much, much bigger than the mass, okay? So this is a relativistic gas. A relativistic gas of particles, the number density must scale as T cube. Because we know that the number density has mass dimension three, the mass is light. All we have to make a dimensionful quantity with mass dimension three is the temperature, okay? So that, that was easy to, to guess. And, uh, this other case is the famous Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. I also put the 2 pi in the right place, but um, all you need to remember is that we get the cube, energy cube, as uh, m chi t to the 3 over 2. So this is dimension 2 inside the parentheses. Everything is 3. Plus, there is a very important exponential suppression. Okay? So this is the Maxwell-Boltzmann suppression. Um, so in the rest of the lecture, I will probably drop many of the two pi's because, as I say, to do things properly, you need to solve the Boltzmann equation in the computer. But we want to see the dependence on the density of, of on the particle physics parameters. So, uh, are we any so the chemical put no um, good. Okay, very good question. So we are making here the assumption that there is no chemical potential. Um, then I will, I will if, so if you have a chemical potential, in the end it's the same way you produce baryons. So in the early universe you have quark and antiquarks. But then you have a very strong annihilation cross-section, you wash out the symmetric component and all you are left is the chemical potential part. So that qualifies as non-thermal production in the sense that the number density, even though they were in thermal equilibrium, the number density is set by the chemical potential that it's something that came from somewhere else, okay? I, I will discuss that later as, as a, so for now, no chemical potential, for now, no chemical potential. Okay. So, this is valid at high temperature because we are in thermal equilibrium. Now, if the dark matter particle is always in thermal equilibrium, all the way to the late universe. This will be very bad because we start to enter the Maxwell-Boltzmann suppression and then we end up with no dark matter around, okay? So departure from, unless you have a chemical potential, as it was just mentioned, you need to go away from thermal equilibrium. And that's the process we will study. So based on that estimate, and now let me introduce a term that is used very often in, in, in the field. The concept of freeze out. So when you stop following this distribution because you do not have annihilations that are effective, the interactions are not able to keep everything in thermal equilibrium, then you reach the freeze out point, okay? From that point, the number density is frozen. It's not constant because the universe it expands. But the processes that change the number of thermal particles are not happening anymore at any significant level, okay? So this is the freeze out, and uh, the freeze out is, there is, there is a temperature associated to the freeze out, and uh, a naive estimate then you solve the Boltzmann equation and you see that this works very well. When the interaction rate evaluated at this temperature is compared to the Hubble rate elevated at the same temperature, you find that these two rates are equal. So that's the freeze out point, 
okay? Which makes sense, because when these two are equal, then you basically stop having efficient annihilation based on the estimate above, okay? So our goal here is, the calculation I want to perform here is the first one is to compute TF, okay? So understand when the freeze out happened. And the second one, which is even more important, is once we know, after freeze out happens, everything is very boring, okay? The dark matter particles are there, they sit there, and the number density in a co-moving volume is frozen, in the sense that the number density itself is not constant, but the only scales because of the dilution due to the expansion of the universe, okay? But what we want to do is to compute the relic density of dark matter and compare with this number that we observe today, okay? Okay, so how does it work? So let's do the first uh, calculation first, okay? So let's compute the freeze out. So in order to compute the freeze out, we have to solve this equation. We have to solve this equation, but to solve this equation, what we need to do is to get an expression for the rate, okay? So let's start from things we know. So we know Hubble, okay? Hubble from the Friedman equation is uh, square root of rho over three and Planck square. So you may see this equation written also, let, let me write that for you also as So there are two ways to write this equation, either with the M-Planck or with the G, the Newton constant. And uh, they are the same. So you can take this as a definition of M-Planck if you want, okay? Because G has mass dimension of energy to the minus two, okay? Uh, so we know that for radiation uh, gas, rho, again, same dimensional analysis if you want. It goes like two to the fourth. Uh, if you think about the black body, for example, it's a photon gas. It's uh, the energy density scales like the temperature to the fourth. Okay, so you plug the number and uh, this is what you get, okay? So Hubble scales like T squared over M Planck up to order one factors that will not affect our estimate. Okay, so we know this, this is good. What we are missing is this, okay? What we're missing is this, so the rate I'll give you the answer. The rate for processes like chi chi going to SM, SM, scales like the number density times the cross section times the relative velocity between the two particles in initial state. And I put an average symbol here because once you have dark matter particles distributed thermally, you make an, an average over all the possible initial states. Okay, you mediate over the initial states. But don't worry about the average, we will Actually, let's do this. We will consider situation where this number is a constant, okay? This happens in many models where if you do a partial wave expansion of the scattering amplitude, you have a contribution already at the S wave. This is just a relativistic expansion of waves. So let's just say that This is a constant, okay? So the only non-trivial temperature dependence enters in N, okay? Now, what expression we use for N? So I wrote you two expressions for N, okay? One for the particle when it's relativistic, T cube, and the other one when the particle is non-relativistic. So this pre-factor times an exponential suppression, okay? So, um, well, the expression you use depends on what value of TF you find, okay? So you can try, and uh, if TF is bigger than M chi, you have what they are called hot relics, okay? And if TF is less, then the mass, then you have cold relics. So they word out and cold, I hope they make sense. 
In the first case, you decouple when you have a temperature higher than your mass. So in some sense, you're hot because you're, you're moving very fast compared to, to, the, to, the energy, the, to the rest energy. And in the second case, it's the opposite, OK? Uh, so both, both, both cases are possible, and you can do the calculation for, for both cases. I will only do the one for cold relics. And uh, there is a reason why I only do that. And the reason why I do the calculation only for this case is because, as we saw yesterday and as I repeated today, uh, we have bounds from uh, structure formation that uh, the dark matter must be called up to, maybe it can be warm, OK? But if the freeze out temperature is much higher than the mass, then uh, it ends up being a hot relic. Um, this is, the first case would be the case for the standard model neutrino, by the way. Okay, so I guess people in the 80s were considering this option for the neutrino of the standard model to be a viable dark matter candidate. If you want to compute the relic density, you have to do the calculation for a hot relic. Okay, so you have to use this expression here. Um, now we know that it cannot be the case, but by the way, hot relics are still important because they, they can give you a contribution to dark radiation. They can give you a correction to N effective, the number of effective neutrinos as measured by CMB. So this calculation is, is, uh, is, is something useful anyway, okay? But I want to focus on cold relics now. And uh, if you want, you can try to do this calculation. And uh, if you want to know details, you can ask me offline, okay? So cold relics. Okay, so for cold relics, so I want a dark matter particle that escapes thermal equilibrium at a temperature below its mass. So when I compare gamma with H, I have to use this expression, okay? So let's use this expression. And uh, let me drop two pi factors. Okay, so, um, sorry, I forgot sigma zero here. So again, this is an assumption, but it's an assumption valid in many models. Sigma v is a constant. You can have models where this is not the case, but just to simplify the discussion. Okay, so I'm comparing n sigma v to, to Hubble, and uh, let me give you some number. So m Planck, the way I define it, Is this 2.4 times 10 to the 18 GeV? And uh, what we do not know in this equation is the value of m chi. We don't know the value of m chi, and we don't know the value of sigma zero. Okay. So for each value of m chi and for each value of sigma zero, we can solve this equation. It's not something you can do analytically because there is a power law, there is an exponential. You have to give the equation to a computer, but it's easy, okay? It takes 30 seconds. Uh, there is a perhaps better way to write this equation by using a convenient variable, which is x. So you can think as the temperature as a time variable, okay? It's like a clock. If you specify me the temperature of the universe, you ten, you can, I can tell you how old the universe was, okay? And here is the same. Instead of the temperature, you use x, which is a dimensionless quantity, which, which is given by the ratio of the dark matter mass over t, okay? Since the universe is cooling down, t goes down as the universe expands, so x grows, okay? So if you go toward the positive direction of x, you're going forward in time. Uh, 
So now you write this equation for, and uh, likewise you can define xf, okay? xf is the variable x evaluated at the freeze out. And since we are talking about cold relics, we want x f bigger than one, okay? Otherwise, we are in contradiction with our assumption that the particle was escaping thermal equilibrium at the temperature lower than the mass. Okay, so you do some math in this equation that I skip, that just give you the final equation. Okay, so this is one of the most important equations of today. Okay, so this is a way to uh, get the freeze-out temperature expressed in terms of x as a function of the dark matter mass and the cross-section. So you see that the value of xf has a very weak dependence on the dark matter mass and on the dark matter cross-section because of this exponential, okay? So you can rewrite this equation as, let's see, uh, xf is one half log xf plus log of okay? So if you change the mass or sigma by a given amount, the sensitive on XF is only logarithmic, okay? The effect. So we can try to plug some numbers, okay? Let's, let's plug some numbers. So let's take, and now I come to the WIMP. So until now I made no assumptions on the mass and on the size of the cross section. Now let me focus on a broad class of dark matter candidates that are WIMPs. So WIMPs is an acronym. It stays for weakly interacting massive particles, okay? So these are particles that they appear very naturally in extension of the standard model which are aimed to solve other problems. So these theories like supersymmetry, extra dimensions, uh, and other, many other ones, they don't want to provide us with a dark matter candidate. They are trying to solve another problem in the standard model which is the hierarchy problem but automatically they provide a dark matter candidate, okay? So you kill two birds with one stone, okay? So you have one theory that solves two problems. So that that's why they are particularly exciting, this, uh, this type of, of candidate. So, as I said before, this is the window of mass, broadly speaking, and the cross section this is the important number. Okay, so it has mass dimension minus two, and uh, it's given by a coupling square over a mass square times a phase space factor that I put just for, to get a better estimate. So here, the coupling constant, I take it to be 10 to the minus two typical values for weak processes, weak uh, interactions, okay? And uh, the mass in the denominator, I take it 100 GV. This is the mass, roughly speaking, of the uh, weak gauge boson. So the Z has nine mass 91, the W80 GV, so let, let's, say, let's call it 100. We're just making an estimate, okay? So if you plug this number here, and, uh, you know, this is a log, so you can just count the exponent and then sum the exponent. I'll give you the result. For WIMPs, you get XF approximately of 25, okay? It can be 28, it can be 22, it can be 30, maybe. It cannot be 1,000, okay? Why? Because the Dependence on the cross-section on the mass is logarithmic, okay? So to increase XF by factor of 100, you have to increase the mass of the cross-section by a lot, okay? So within this WIMP window, you 
you get a very solid result for xf, which is given by more or less 25. And uh, this is a good news, because we wanted this. Remember, we wanted the, the relic to be cold, okay? So it's a consistency check, if you want. It, it gives us a confirmation that what we were doing was correct, okay? Okay, so we succeeded in doing this, okay? Any questions so far? It's clear? Good, okay. So for cold relics, you quit thermal equilibrium at a temperature which is roughly speaking the mass over a factor of 25 or 30, okay? Now, we need to perform the second task, which is the most important task, which is to compute the relic density, okay? Because we always have to face this number and we want to make sure that whatever model we are working on is able to reproduce this number. Okay, so let's see. Um, there are many ways to compute rho. There are many ways, let's go for a quick one. Uh, so what is rho? Rho, since these are cold relics, all the energy density is stored in the mass, okay? So rho, uh, actually let's call it rho chi, okay? Because we have chi here. Is m chi times n chi, so mass, number density. This is true all the time, okay? Now, what is xi chi? Xi, uh, xi chi is, I have the definition here, is the rho times the entropy density, okay? Okay, so at temperatures below the freeze out temperature, I can write this equation in this way. Okay. So A is the scale factor. Uh, since the denominator is always constant, S times A cube is constant because the entropy in a commoving volume is conserved. Okay, the entropy density is not constant, but the entropy density times the scale factor cube is constant. And also the number density times A cube is constant after freeze out because there are no reactions happening anymore. And so the number density is depleting its value with the expansion, okay? So N chi goes like A to the minus three, one over the volume. So N chi times A cube is constant, okay? So this is constant. And uh, this is constant and it's also convenient, since it's constant, let's evaluate it at a time that we can evaluate it easily, okay? So the time which is the best time is the freeze out time, okay? So if I evaluate this ratio at the freeze out, then I'm sure that after freeze out, up to small corrections that you can only capture by solving the Boltzmann equation, this ratio is constant, okay? So in particular, is the one I measure today, okay? Okay, so now the estimate is easy because This is just the definition of freeze out. So the number density at freeze out times the cross section is equal to Hubble at freeze out because of the definition. I define the freeze out this way, okay? So when I focus on freeze out, I also have to specify the entropy density. So entropy density, I mean, you, can, you can give the full expression, 
This is the statistical mechanics result. There are pi factors, there are g star factors. These are order of one factors, okay? It's just the freeze out temperature cube, okay? So now we are done because Cd, sorry, C chi, which is rho chi over S, both evaluated at freeze out, but I emphasize you do this at freeze out, it stays equal to its value forever, okay? Is what? M chi, um, M chi, N chi freeze out, which is Tf square over M Planck times sigma zero, divided by Tf cube, which is the entropy density, okay? So I can simplify this Tf, Tf here. I am left to only one power, and I recognize that I have an XF factor, okay? So XF is M chi over Tf, okay? Okay, now, um, we are basically done because, let me write this equation again, which is important, and I want to write that in a different way. So I can take this equation as a result. For the cross section, I need to produce the dark matter with the right value density, okay? So Xi, sorry, this is Xi chi. If you want Xi dm, okay, so this is the one I measure. I want, now I put the number from the observation. So we saw from the previous calculation that Xf is 25 up to logarithmic corrections in the mass and in the cross section. So let's take it to be around 25. Then we have C, D. I said the precise number is 0 0.44 electron volt. Let's say one electron volt. M Planck is 10 to the 18 GV. So it's 10 to the 27 electron volt, okay? Now, a miracle is about to happen here, okay? Because you want to know what is the scale associated with the cross-section. So if we write the cross-section as in this way here, so let's do that. You have weak coupling, 32, Pi, and let me, let me call this M star. I don't know what this M is. I want to solve. This must be XF, which is 25, okay, times, uh, sorry, over 10 to the 27 EV square, okay? So I just put the numbers here. Okay, so if I take for the coupling constant, the one, so now you can try to put the numbers, okay? If you put for alpha, alpha 10 to the minus two, and you put for the M, the weak scale, you find that these numbers are in agreement, okay? So if you go to dark matter talks or, or read dark matter article, this equation is also known as the WIMP miracle, okay? So why people claim it's a miracle? They claim it's a miracle because we have reasons to expect new degrees of freedom at the weak scale, so we have reason to expect new particles with this mass and with this coupling for reasons independent on the dark matter, okay? So this is the hierarchy problem in the standard model. And, um, as I say, many frameworks like supersymmetry, extra dimensions, they naturally provide us with dark matter candidates. And uh, it's amazing that if you do the 
calculation, and you, here you have no freedom, okay? You know the coupling constant, you know the mass, you do the calculation, and you find that you reproduce the relative density. So you have this particle for reasons independent of dark matter, you compute the dark matter abundance, and you find that the density is the same as the one you observe. Yes? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that. Yes, so to do things properly, and you can, you can put here xf as function of the mass and of sigma zero. And then you solve for sigma zero. So that, that's the proper way to do that. Because XF, you remember xf depending on mk and sigma zero, right? So you put a mass now, and then you solve for sigma zero. You, you can totally do that. Now, the reason why I put 25 is that I, I had an equation before that was 25 plus log uh, corrections. So if you change this, if you change sigma zero by a factor even of 100, xf doesn't change very much, okay? So this is just for an estimate on the blackboard, okay? So if you want to do the calculation, you have to do the calculation with the computer. But this 25 is very robust. If you change sigma by factors even of 100 or 1,000, 25 will stay 20, 28, maybe 30, but it will not change very much. But Well, that depends, that depends, because you have, well, I will discuss that on Wednesday, uh, Thursday. Direct detection, it, it depends, because you, you have to rotate the diagram, but maybe you annihilate to uh, muons. So direct detection probes the coupling with nucleons. But you may have thermal production set by annihilation to muons or to top quarks or to taus, or you may have spin-dependent cross-section. So in the direct detection. So I, we will go through this on, on, on Thursday, but it's model dependent. There are models where this is excluded. But going from the Rayleigh density calculation to the direct detection cross-section, it's a model dependent step to connect the cross-section because we are probing a different process. We, we, we will see more on, on Thursday. Oh, wow, okay. Okay, so, yeah, uh, one more thing about the last question. Uh, I said that this was 25. The reason why I didn't, I didn't care too much about 25 versus 30 is because here I have two numbers that are very different from each other. So the Planck mass is 10 to the 27 electron volt, and the Xi is one, okay? So if I have 25 or 50 here, I mean, the, the interesting thing is this equation is that I'm taking the product of two things very different. And in some sense, the geometric mean of these two things, because if I want to solve for m, I have to take the square root of this. So the geometric mean of two very different numbers give me the weak scale. So that's the win miracle. I don't like this name. It's not a miracle, okay? It's just a, it's a coincidence. It's a, it's a coincidence, but as you see from this equation, this is a question, an equation for sigma. So all the wind miracle tells you is that you need the sigma as big as the weak scale value. But if the dark matter mass is even 10 MeV, so much smaller than the, the weak scale, you still get the right Rayleigh density, okay? So it's not really a miracle. It's, it's remarkable that, that we get this, um, this, uh, this coincidence between two big number, two, one small number, one big number, you take the geometric mean, and you get the weak scale. But it doesn't point at a particle with mass, the weak scale, okay? Because you solve for sigma, not for m. Okay, yes. Good, okay, so let, let's discuss this now, let's discuss this now. Okay, so, uh, yeah, let's do that now. Uh, so the question is, what about BBN? Um, so there are constraints from BBN, which was actually the next point I wanted to make. So 
So, let me summarize here what we, we found so far. So what we found so far was the following, X, F, I can solve for X, F. I have an equation, I choose M, I choose sigma, I solve. Oh, yes, yes, otherwise it's bad. Okay, very good, thanks. Log of X, F. Yeah, 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 thank you. So, if you plug the numbers we've been playing with so far, we say X, F is 25. Then we have an equation that tells us that sigma zero, in order to reproduce the abundance, is the xf you get from solving the previous equation divided by xd times and Planck, okay? That was the other equation. Okay, now, this equation is telling us that sigma must be very close to weak scale cross sections, the win miracle. It doesn't tell us much about M, because M enters here. So let me emphasize this by putting the dependence on the mass and on the cross-section on the, on, the, the, on the XF. And uh, so I, I, there is really no way this equation is telling me something about the mass other than pointing at the value for the cross-section, which is a dimension full parameter. But there is also a coupling constant inside the cross-section, so I can play with, this, with these values. Uh, now, I claim that thermal relics, and this is precisely the BBN point, no, G, M, E, B. So they must have a mass uh, bigger than one M, E, V, okay? Why? If the mass is lower than one MeV, and these are thermal, so this is only valid for thermal relics. Mm -hmm. The axion is a fine dark matter candidate, it's non-thermal, this limit doesn't apply, okay? Why? Because if I have a thermal particle with mass below one, sorry, with mass um, below one MeV, I reach BBN, and then I have this ensemble of relativistic particles with a full T cube abundance, annihilating into standard model particles. So there are two effects. I'm going to change the number of neutrinos, the effective number of neutrinos at BBN because I have new light stuff. And that's bad for me because we know that BBN tells us that there must be three neutrinos. There is some uncertainty, but, um, but you cannot add. If you add the Dirac fermion, Dirac fermion has four degrees of freedom, so two polarization particle and antiparticle, so you're going to mess up the number of n-effective, uh, and, and, and neutrino, sorry, not n-effective, the value of an n-neutrino. The other issue is that this dark matter annihilation also uh, dump energy into the plasma, so you can affect the way the elements are um, formed in the, in, the, in the BBN processes. And so, to stay, well, you can study these things in details, but to be safe, if you say that the mass is above one MeV, by the time you get to BBN, you are already in the Maxwell-Boltzmann tail of the distribution, because it's e to the minus m over t, okay? And so at that point, you can forget about, I mean, you don't have to forget for the dark matter calculation, but you can forget for the, relic de for the BBN uh, process. So, this is an upper limit, um, lower limit, there is also an upper limit, which I mentioned quickly, and uh, it follows from unitarity. So unitarity, and uh, I'll just give you the result, and you are more than welcome to, to ask me questions. So there is, if you impose unitarity, unitarity, which just means that when you compute probabilities, the sum of all probabilities must give you, must give you one. There is a bound on the annihilation cross-section that has to be less than four pi over m chi squared, okay? 
but we know that sigma zero is kind of fixed from this equation. Sigma zero as a precise number, okay? So you can look at this equation as an upper limit on the mass because you just rewrite this equation as, as this. So somebody asked me before about upper limits. So this is one upper limit I know. And uh, for thermal relics, is approximately 100 TV, okay? Okay, so since we have five minutes left, there is no time to do freezing, but let me tell you something very important. So I will tell you two things. Um, So the first thing is that when you actually work on this and you write a paper, you don't do these estimates that I made on the, on the blackboard. You do a serious calculations, which has to be done numerically because you have to solve a differential equation. This equation I'm about to write, okay? So this is a differential equation where you solve for n, chi, as a function of time. And uh, there is a better way, well, better way, more convenient way to write this equation in terms of dimensionless quantities. Y chi, which is n chi over the entropy density. So this is called the commoving entropy density, uh, commoving number density. This is convenient because this variable scales out the effect of the expansion, okay? So if you are uh, away from thermal equilibrium, Y is constant, okay? And the other variable is this variable we have already seen before, which is a different time variable, is M over T. So once you change variable and you just use dimensional, and you, the way you do that is, well, it, it's nicer to have the commoving number density because you then don't worry about the expansion anymore. But also because when you give this equation to a computer to do numerical solutions, it's nicer to use uh, dimensionless variables. And the equation you solved is uh, is this uh, x. Uh, Okay, so that's the equation you solve to get the relic density. And uh, you may have seen, there is a famous plot that it's in many textbooks and uh, again, if you go to a dark matter talk, many people start they talk with this plot, so let me explain to you what this plot means. So, let me use a different color. So this is the equilibrium number density, okay? The equilibrium number density for y feels the Maxwell-Boltzmann suppression, okay? So Y is this N chi over S. We have seen that for the relativistic particles, N chi is a Maxwell-Boltzmann factor exponential. So this is what you would have if you're always in equilibrium. If you solve the Boltzmann equation numerically, what you find is that at early times you are in equilibrium, of course. But then, you go away from thermal equilibrium, and this is precisely the 25 number we have seen today. So this is the freeze out.
And this is the actual way you do the calculation. So you solve for y, and uh, you look for this asymptotic value that stays constant under freeze out. That gives you the commoving number density today. And then in the last few minutes, big. Okay, so this is something I already this is something I already mentioned yesterday. Uh, we are able to extrapolate the thermal history of the universe only up to temperatures of 1 MeV, the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Okay? We don't know the energy content of the universe above BBN. We have no way to say what it was. And uh, the simplest thing you can do, you extrapolate this picture you have from BBN to higher temperatures. But there is an assumption. And uh, Hubble, by Hubble, I mean the function h of t for t above t bbn, which is approximately 1 MeV. Okay? So all the interesting things that happened during today's lectures were above this temperature. I even brought that, that we want particles with masses above 1 MeV. So that's the calculations I sketched today is based on an assumption, which is the simplest thing you can do. And going away from this assumption requires some uh, non-trivial extension of, your, of cosmological history. And there are constraints. It's not always easy to do that, but it's possible. So this is just to say that you may hear people saying that this model is excluded by relic density, because this model fails to reproduce relic density. So you should not believe this, because it fails to explain relic density by performing the calculation in the simplest case, which is based on an assumption. But it's very easy to, to go beyond, and I also work on these things. So if you want to know more, you can ask me offline. OK, thank you.